Hi, welcome to the British Bats q and I'm Chris Deke, I'm an ecologist with the RSPB and I've been working for them for about 16 years now. The last eight years I've been getting interested in bats and I spend most of my spare time doing voluntary bat research such as checking bat boxes, doing catching sessions and generally trying to find out what makes the bats in, in the UK tick. So today I'll be answering your questions on British bats and the first two are quite similar and they come from Kelly Newbury and Twitter handle rambling on. Kelly asks, we recently saw a bat during the day and she asks whether this is common. Rambling on's question is why are bats occasionally seen in the middle of the day? Well, seeing bats in the day isn't common I would, I would say, but it's not unusual either. Um, and they might be active during the day for a variety of reasons. Um, they may have been disturbed in their roost, be that through a human, a predator, or quite possibly the roost has just become unpleasant, uh, unpleasant to be in. It could be too hot, it could be raining in, or something like that. And they're looking for a safer place, or a place that is less wet or less hot. So they might move roosts in the days and you might see them then. Another reason bats might be out in the day is to find food. Especially in, in spring and summer, after wet or cold nights, um, they might be trying to make up for lost time um, and hunting the insects in the day. In winter time, conversely, they might be out in in warm and nice weather um, because that's more likely to have in, to bring the insects out. The second question is also from Rambling On, who asks uh, whether any of our British bats carry diseases like some others do, and the answer is yes, they can. Um, two of our species, Dorbentans bats and Serotine, have been identified as positively carrying a rabies-like virus called European bat virus. Now it's incredibly rare to find this in bats. Uh, of the 15,000 animals tested by Public Health England to date, less than 30 have tested positive for the virus. Um, that's about 0.2% of the animals tested have, had, have, sh have been shown to be positive for either strain of the virus. Um, it's also even less likely that this, this can be contracted by humans as it need, you need to be bitten by a bat or the bat saliva needs to enter a wound or a mucous membrane. So if you do need to handle a bat, and I strongly advise that you don't unless you absolutely have to, um, wear gloves, um, washing up gloves, marigolds or gardening gloves will be sufficient in most cases. Um, but if you've got something big like a serotine or a noctule, then you might want something more heavy duty. Or grab a towel and wrap the bat, bat up in that. This also applies to dead bats and contact the Bat Conservation Trust who can um, give you the number of your nearest bat carer. So next question is from Daniel Wright who asks, how do you expect climate change to affect species distribution? Will we see new arrivals and lose some of our currently resident species? Well this is really difficult Daniel because climate change is fairly unpredictable and bats we know even less about than, we, than um, about much of our other animals and plants in the country. Um, them being nocturnal it makes them very very tricky to study and we still don't really know um, how many we've got, where they are and what they're doing so um, this, this makes it really difficult to predict but it's entirely possible that with um, milder winters and, wa and warmer summers um, there might be more food availability, there might be longer flight seasons further north so we may see a northerly shift in some of our more southerly species such as the Barbastel or Beckstein's bat um, and equally we might see uh, immigration from mainland Europe and indeed we are seeing um, increased records of things like Savvy's Pipistrel and cool Pipistrel and the Pond Bat which occur in mainland Europe but don't in the UK. Um, now these, these could be vagrants, they could be um, the first wave of, uh, of colonizers or it could just be that um, bat detectors are becoming cheaper and more available and there's simply more people out there looking for bats. Um, so only time will really tell um, whether what's, what's happening there and just to remind you that in the 1980s, um, as this is only about 40 years ago, we split out the Pipistrel into common Pipistrel and Soprano Pipistrel and in 2001 researchers found a species new to science in Europe, in Greece, the Alcathoe bat, and in 2010, uh, this is only 10 years ago, we found this animal in the UK, so it's entirely possible that these records of of these vagrants or, or immigrants could be um, that they've always been here and it's and it's just a normal background, only time will tell really on that I'm afraid. 
So whether we'll actually lose any of our species is, is also quite tricky um, to predict. Um, what I do know is that the Soprano pipistrelle, our commonest species in the UK, um, is very rare in other parts of Europe where, for example, coolest pipistrelle is very common, a species we don't get here. So it's entirely possible they occupy the same ecological niche. And if coolest pipistrelle were to colonise the UK, we might see a decline in Soprano pipistrelle, which may then find its strongholds further north. Okay, uh, Phil Calvert asks, what can I do to encourage bats to my garden? Well, Phil, um, a garden that's generally wildlife friendly is, is probably going to be pretty good for bats, um, as you will have um, things to attract the insects. But anything that will attract more night flying insects to your garden is going to be good for bats. So water features can be good, um, but you might not want to encourage the midges and the mozzies, but then you will get the bats to, to eat them. Um, or night flowering plants, um, plants that are more fragrant at night, such as uh, wisteria, evening prim primrose or honeysuckle. Uh, also, having trees and hedges can, can help because bats like cover when they're foraging. So just vast open areas um, are probably not going to be too good for them. And equally, putting up bat boxes on trees or buildings can help, um, but they may not be taken up if they've got a nice roost around in the area. Um, so a, a nice tree hole or a nice cosy loft. Right, and the last question I've got today is from Beth Markey and she asks what the easiest way to tell species are apart. It's pretty difficult to tell when they're in flight. Yes Beth, they are. Um, first thing I'd, I'd say is to look for the size of the animal. Um, this can be quite difficult to appreciate when they're fluttering about as e and even a pipistrelle which is about the size of my thumb um, will look quite large in flight. But the wingspan is, is about, in the British bats, from about 20 centimetres on a, on a soprano pipistrelle all the way up to 45 centimetres in an octure. That's about 8 to 18 inches in old, in old money. So your first clue can be the size. Is it a small or a large animal? And with practice you'll be able to sort of spot the in-betweeners as well. Now next thing I'd look out for is the flight pattern. Now is it fast and erratic, fast and straight, or is it slow and fluttering? And also, um, what, what is their bat actually doing? Is it flying sort of straight along a hedgerow? Is it flying high above the tree line? Or is it sort of fluttering in and out of cover? So that's, that's a good clue. Um, what is the animal actually doing? Put that together with, f with size and how it's flying. And you can start, start putting together a picture of what it might be. Um, so, for example, um, if you get a good look of bats flying over water, low over water, you might see that they've got white white undersides. Now these are probably going to be Dorbentons or Natteris bats um, and as a rule of thumb Dorbentons bats will fly very very low over water because they actually um, catch insects off the water surface um, and they will usually fly below knee height whereas Natteris bats will fly a little bit higher between sort of knee and waist height. But as with anything in nature that's just a rule of thumb and you can't really rely on that to accurately ID but it can give you an idea of what you've got. And so I've put that together with the other things I've, I've just said um, you, might, you might be able to get closer to the ID, if not ID the animal. Uh, likewise, if, you've got, if you can see a large bat with very broad wings and silhouette above you, um, and you might be, even be able to see that the tail projects beyond the tail membrane, now that's a serotine, um, and it's, it's one of the nice bats because it's fairly easily identical just, just by looking at it in silhouette. Uh, most bats aren't that easy, but serotine, serotines are quite nice that way. Um, same with a large bat with long narrow wings, almost like a swift. Um, will probably be a noctule or possibly a Lysler's bat um, which will be a little bit smaller than a noctule but not, but not enough really to identify them just by, by looking at them. Um, and the reason they've, they've got wings like a swift is that they actually act like a swift. Um, they will be hunting for insects high above the tree line, high above even, even open fields. So they're, they're also a quite a nice species. Um, but with learning any new group, um, try to focus on the, on the easy ones, the ones I've just described, and a few others. Pipistrelles will be quite small and, you, and they will be the commonest bat you'll see. Um, and once you've got those nailed, you will be able to um, work out that um, different, different animals. Um, but don't get frustrated if, if you can't ID absolutely every last one. But to, and to really get into uh, bats, you'll need one of these. Um, this is a bat detector and it picks up the ultrasound that bats emit when, they, when they're flying around hunting for insects. Um, and just like with birdsong, with practice, you may be able to um, 
learn what bat emits what calls because just like birds they have, they have they make different noises and and echolocate at different frequencies so with practice and one of these you'll you'll certainly be able to to tell is that a nocturnal is that a pipistrelle things like that and again start with the easy ones and then you'll realize that that one actually hang on a minute that one sounds different um i'll, I'll have a look, listen to that one but even with one of these and a lot of practice there'll still be a lot of back calls that you won't be able to identify so you might need to record them and run them through um, sound analysis software and um, but to explain all that I we'd have to get very very technical and I don't really have time to do that but I'll give you a good starting point here this is the Field Studies Council guide to British bats and it's a really nice little pull out guide which has got pictures of all our species on the front and on the back it's got all those things I've talked about. It's got size of the bat. It's it's got flight pattern. It's got it's got um, it's got flight behaviour. It's it's even got the echolocation details and everything like that. So this is a really good little starter if you want to get in, if you want to get into bats. Okay, that's all we've got time for today. So um, well, bats are going to come out of hibernation very soon and we should start seeing them eating bugs in the garden very very soon so I'm, I'm quite excited about the weather that's, that's turning nicer so I'll be heading out with a bat detector before too long. Thanks very much for listening.